<clears throat> okay, assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. On behalf of organizer of Indus Water System webinar series, I have Benazir Iqbal from National Center of Excellence in Geology, University of Peshawar, welcomes you all. This webinar is jointly organized by National Center of Excellence in Geology, University of Peshawar, Pakistan, Geological Survey of Pakistan, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and National Center of GIS and Space Application in Geosciences, Islamabad, Pakistan. This webinar series of virtual seminars covers a range of topics related to the water resources of Indus River system, climate change, and cryosphere. This webinar targeted the researchers, organizations, practitioners, and postgraduate students involved in water-related activities. This webinar is comprised of one hour with 40 minutes of talk and 20 minutes of question answer session. So today, You are muted, Benazir. <clears throat> oh, we are sorry. It didn't start yet. No, I will start it, but actually, you are introducing okay, uh, okay, Dr. Okay. Hashmito. Okay. Now, now, do you hear me? Yes. We can yes, hear it's fine. Okay, it's uh, we have we have. We have uh, seven uh, talk of the webinar series, Pakistan's water in times of climate emergency, turning challenge and to opportunity by Dr. Muhammad Zia Hashmi, Head Water Resources and Glaciology. Um, Dr. Zia Hashmi has a doctorate in civil engineering with research focusing on hydrology and climate change. Currently, he is leading the water resources in gla glaciology section of GCISC where he runs a program on implications of high mountains, climate change, and Pakistan's future water security. He has been GCICS focal person for various regional international forums, such as the Upper Andes Basin Network, Indus Forum, and MRI's uh, group on elevation and dependent warming. He has been providing inputs to Ministry of Climate Change Pakistan on various water-related issues, especially in the area of mountain hydrology and glaciology. He has been a part of a number of joint projects at national and international level and high-quality research publication. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Benazir, for your generous, generous uh, introduction of me. Uh, I'm just a student of uh, hydrology and water resources and I try to learn every day. So today uh, I'm really happy. I'm really thankful to the organizers uh, for providing me this opportunity to talk to uh, an elite group of people. And I would try to share some uh, useful things, but at the same time I would like to get comments uh, and suggestions so that I can learn few things as well, and I can, uh, I mean, improve my understanding. And uh, next time when when we meet, uh, I'll be in a better shape to talk about these important things. So let me share <clears throat> my screen first, so that uh, I can immediately start without wasting any minute. And. Uh, So can everybody see my screen and hear my voice clearly? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. Hear you. All fine. And yeah. yeah, and you can see my slides. Yes, also the screen. Yes, also. Yes, sir. It's, it's all okay. fine. <clears throat> so uh, let me start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, I, as I have been introduced, I work at the Global Change Impact Study Center in Islamabad, which is basically a research arm of uh, the Ministry of Climate Change. And uh, here at GCISC, I work with the Water Resources and Glaciology section, where are uh, where we are actually uh, trying to undertake research related to 
uh, water issues or water woes of uh, Pakistan and uh, implications of climate change and what can be uh, future adaptation strategies uh, to actually combat climate change impacts and uh, make Pakistan's progress sustainable and climate resilient. So uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, let's start with the, what we uh, know about climate change right now. So, uh, I mean, oh, there is more than 99% researchers and scientists uh, consensus on these uh, few things related to climate change. Firstly, uh, it is now very well understood that climate change is real. It is uh, no more considered as a myth or uh, something which is not real. So climate change is real. Secondly, it is already here. It is not, not, not something related to future or not something which is coming, but it is already here. And it is here to stay. I mean, uh, you, we all know that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions are the main uh, reason for uh, changes in abrupt changes in the climate. <clears throat> but uh, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases which we have already uh, uh, injected into the atmosphere, uh, the amount is so high that uh, even we uh, stop and uh, drop the greenhouse gas emissions to zero immediately even then we would uh, have to face uh, the climate change and climate change impacts for uh, many years to come. So that is why it is said that climate change is here to stay. And lastly, uh, it is now well understood that climate change is human in induced. It is anthropogenic. The humans are the cause of the reason for uh, the uh, excessive greenhouse gas emissions that has caused climate change. So this is, uh, these are few things which we all uh, being uh, the being researchers in climate change or even the common individuals in any country, we all need to have these four points in mind and we need to uh, actually design our actions according to these. Uh, in this slide, this spatial map is showing the uh, changes in Earth's surface temperature, uh, or that is the average over the period of 1901 to 2012, which is uh, the uh, last century and the early part of uh, this century. And uh, globally, in, the glo in terms of the global average temperature, we have already crossed the one degree centigrade mark. In Pakistan, we actually are observing uh, a rise in the average temperature more than the global uh, rise in the global average temperature. So if it is globally, it is one degree centigrade. In Pakistan, it is 1.1 or 1.2 degree centigrade. Uh, and we all are already experiencing the impacts or the implications of this rising temperature rise in, in the uh, average temperature or globally and uh, in, in one country. Then in this slide, uh, I show you that uh, what is the main uh, manifestation of climate change. Climate change globally is manifesting itself in the form of increasing frequency of disasters, increasing frequency of extreme events related to climate, weather, or uh, um, or uh, other things which are directly or indirectly related to climate and weather. So in this uh, uh, picture, you see that starting from 1970 and going up to a recent year, uh, 2019, you see uh, the extreme events are continuously on the rise. Uh, but the more important thing is that you see the color, the blue shades of color, and then also the red uh, shades <clears throat> of colors. You see these are uh, these are more share 
then uh, the green colors uh, or I mean the blue and the reds are basically the events which are due to climate change or which has linkage with climate or weather. Um, uh, for example, floods, extreme weather, drought, extreme temperature. So uh, this shows that <clears throat> Climate change is, uh, I mean, not only a thing that uh, 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 creates problems for sustainable development, but it is, it has become a matter of survival for many countries uh, across the globe. Same is the case, but uh, rather it is even a uh, worse case for Pakistan. And we, when we talk about Pakistan's climate case, uh, the three things which immediately come to uh, our minds are the floods, heat waves, and droughts. And we have seen their uh, I mean, extreme level of uh, examples of these three kinds of events. Like we experienced a super flood in 2010, which actually pushed us back uh, many years. Uh, in terms of our development uh, uh, and also in 2015 we experienced uh, a heat wave, the worst ever uh, heat wave in the history of the country where we had more than 1000 casualties and then uh, there is drought. Uh, we uh, hear about drought in different parts of Sindh and Balochistan and uh, people are suffering from drought as well. So there is uh, either too much water or too little water. So it, this shows that uh, climate change for Pakistan is mostly about water. So Pakistan, I would I say, and uh, my uh, teachers like uh, Dr. Adil Najam always say that Pakistan's climate case is, uh, is uh, uh, almost a water case. I mean, if we uh, deal with the issues which we are facing uh, with water, if we deal with those issues, then we would be able to deal with the issue of climate change in Pakistan. So uh, before going into more details uh, of on Pakistan's water problems and uh, what are their po possible solutions and what uh, the government of Pakistan uh, is currently doing. Uh, let's see at this picture, which is showing a typical Himalayan water resources system. I mean, this is uh, a water resources system which is almost uh, there in all the Himalayan countries, including India, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, or Nepal, uh, China. Uh, so, I mean, you see, oh, the it has uh, like three main components. The uh, highest elevation or source zone component where we have uh, I mean, glaciers and seasonal snow and permafrost uh, and wetlands. The uh, I mean we uh, receive in the summer times we receive uh, melt water from glaciers and uh, snow melt and which uh, makes uh, most of uh, the major rivers in this region uh, uh, as perennial rivers and they are able to flow throughout the year because they get uh, uh, in in the summer time they get uh, monsoon rainfall and uh, as well and before the monsoon time uh, they get uh, meltwater from glaciers and snow then the transition zone there is a transition zone where the water that is being generated from the upstream high mountainous area uh, then this uh, water is regulated for uh, irrigation hydropower and uh, other uses and uh, we distribute this water to downstream uh, in pakistan uh, it is uh, majorly used for agriculture purposes <clears throat> through a vast uh, network of uh, irrigation system. And then the bottom uh, or the last uh, very important part of uh, this uh, water resources system is the river delta. So same is the case with, uh, with Pakistan. And you see over here that we have the high elevation source region 
uh, where we have uh, the Him uh, Himalaya, uh, Karakoram and Hindu Kush mountain ranges where we have huge reserves of uh, glaciers and uh, snowpack and our rivers, mainly the Indus River uh, gets the meltwater. It's like uh, in different studies uh, report it differently, but around 50 to 60 percent of water coming in the Indus is from uh, glacier and snow melt and then uh, rest of the water that flows through the Indus uh, is coming from the monsoon uh, precipitation. Then the middle zone, the middle part, which uh, I call as the water use region in Pakistan, where we uh, distribute the water uh, coming from the upstream through a network of dams and barrages and headworks and canals, distributaries, uh, link canals, and then uh, water courses at the farm level. And uh, in this region, we use about more than 90% of water. So agriculture is basically uh, the highest user in Pakistan of water, and it uses more than 90% of water. And then, of course, uh, the important uh, component of the Indus uh, River system is the Indus Delta region, where the Indus River meets the Arabian Sea and forms a delta. And uh, in the next slide, we'll see that there are I mean, various uh, issues or challenges to each of this different, these uh, different zones. Like when we talk about the high elevation zone, uh, as a researcher, I feel that the main uh, issue or main problem uh, which actually uh, uh, brings a lot of uncertainty about the future of water in this region and in this country specifically is the data scar scarcity issue and even absence of high elevation climate data. Literally, we do not have uh, any uh, climate station above the elevation of 5000 meters, which provides us with a long term series of uh, climate records, because for any climate analysis, we need at least 20 to 30 years of data to come up with a reliable uh, climate analysis. So at the moment, I mean, uh, there is work going on. I mean, uh, Pakistan Meteorological Department and, and uh, uh, Glacier Monitoring Research Center of WABDA are trying because these are the two data collection uh, agencies in Pakistan, especially in the mountainous region of Pakistan. These two are trying to install more stations uh, above the elevation of 5,000 meters, especially in the Karakoram region. But I mean, even uh, if they are immediately successful in this attempt, it would require at least uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, uh, I mean, when we would be able to uh, ben make beneficial use of the data collected by those stations. Uh, at the moment, uh, there is, a, 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 I mean, a network of uh, around 20 uh, climate stations, uh, which we call the automatic uh, weather and climate stations by installed by Wabda. And the highest station out of these 20 stations uh, is a, has been installed at Hunjarab, which is uh, less than, uh, which is uh, at the elevation of less than 5000 meters above sea level. Then uh, we all know that uh, the uh, the glaciers and the snow are highly sensitive to any changes in temperature and we know that uh, there is temperature average temp rise in the average temperature in this country so uh, which makes uh, uh, things more complicated when we talk about the melt water coming from glacier and snow melt in the indus basin and uh, we heavily depend on uh, Indus River system flows in terms of uh, our economy, in terms of our development. So, which makes us more vulnerable uh, when we talk about uh, changes in temperature and precipitation. So, uh, I mean, this makes us highly uh, 
vulnerable to uh, climate change. Then uh, there is already large year to year variability in this in, in this uh, river system flows and climate change is actually uh, making it uh, worse and the variability is increasing and also it is uh, uh, bringing with it more uncertainty. So which makes uh, life very tough for the water regulators and or, or water distributors or the, the water distribution system of this country to provide uh, the required amount of water at the right time to different uh, water users. Then uh, currently we have a very low storage capacity as compared to other neighboring and uh, other countries which depend on their water resources. So uh, we need to actually immediately enhance our storage capacity in different forms like uh, large medium and small dams and or things uh, like that uh, due to uh, rise rapid rise in our population uh, and uh, also due to the water use practices which are not uh, very efficient in water use our per capita water availability is rapidly declining and it was around 6000 cubic meter uh, when we got independence uh, in 1947 and it has now uh, dropped down to less than 1000 cubic meter. So this is really alarming. It is going down and down. Uh, main reason is rise in population, but also uh, our practices of water use, which are not sustainable, which are not uh, water efficient. Then the uh, current uh, conveyance uh, or water distribution system uh, or the farm level water use efficiency, it is very low as I have already said that uh, our distribution system uh, has at various uh, uh, points, uh, it has uh, too much seepage and the uh, water which uh, flows through the canals uh, is seeping down to uh, the groundwater and uh, especially in the regions where the groundwater quality is not very good, uh, this is not a productive thing that the water uh, through the, uh, I mean, when flows it, uh, the water flows through the unlined channels, it seeps down to groundwater. I mean, uh, because if the groundwater is all already of not uh, uh, usable quality, then if, uh, if we add more fresh water to it, uh, it would not, uh, I mean, help in any way. So we need to actually um, line or do certain measures to stop uh, water seepage at different uh, sections. Uh, I, mean, I mean, carefully uh, examining our conveyance system, our canal system, and then deciding that where we need uh, the lining or certain measures to stop water seepage uh, downwards of the irrigation water. Then we, uh, all of our water resources uh, in Pakistan are basically transboundary, which makes uh, the climate case of Pakistan more challenging. Uh, you see on the, on the eastern side, we have uh, uh, shared waters with India, on the western side, we have uh, shared waters with uh, uh, Afghanistan and uh, the current, uh, we have uh, Indus Waters Treaty with India, but uh, that does not uh, properly account for climate change uh, considerations. Uh, so we actually and maybe need to discuss that, uh, uh, are there any changes required in this Indus Waters Treaty when we consider climate change and the provisions of the of this treaty. And also we need uh, immediately a treaty with Afghanistan on our shared waters so that in future Afghanistan can also make a beneficial use of uh, the water and it uh, should not or it must not affect Pakistan's uh, water uses or the uh, water which is coming to Pakistan and being used uh, in different parts of this country uh, for different purposes. So it should be mutually beneficial 
the we, normally a uh, term benefit sharing approach is uh, discussed so that we can we both uh, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan both of these countries should make beneficial use of the water that is uh, being shared between these two countries then the Indus Delta uh, the I mean the last part of the Indus River system uh, because uh, uh, due to the construction of a uh, number of uh, water regulation uh, structures across the Indus River and its uh, major tributaries, uh, we have actually stopped the continuous supply of water uh, to flow down the Kotri Barrage. Kotri Barrage is basically the last water sources regulation structure on the Indus River and after that the uh, water goes to Arabian Sea unregulated but uh, unfortunately uh, more than 90 percent of the time in a year uh, there is almost zero flow that is going down the Kotri Barrage. It makes the Indus Delta highly vulnerable because it uh, allows the seawater to intrude into the uh, coastal zone and uh, I mean deteriorate the uh, groundwater quality over there and uh, also uh, I mean uh, affect the livelihood of the people over there and also it is causing uh, land subsidence uh, and in future years in future decades if there is also a problem of uh, sea uh, water sea level rise in in Pakistan then it would make this problem more uh, challenging, more problematic for us. And we actually need to uh, consider uh, how we can assure, uh, I mean, a regular supply of fresh water to flow uh, below Kotri Barrage so that we can uh, sustain the ecosystem over there, we can sustain the uh, condition, the health of uh, Indus Delta for the years to come. So uh, what is Pakistan's response to all of these uh, different issues, these challenges to Pakistan's water resources? I mean, in any country, the response has uh, three stages or three steps. It starts with reliable, sound, thorough research, which helps the policymakers to devise uh, required policies and then uh, there are different agencies which are responsible for taking action so the policy guides the action and then there are certain actions that are uh, that are taken in any country that helps to uh, mitigate the problem or to overcome the problem so uh, these in Pakistan these different uh, steps or these different stages uh, all of these three are being guided by Pakistan's climate agenda and Pakistan's climate agenda is uh, very simple very clear it has three points it uh, firstly is talk about the safety and well-being of the people because uh, we have seen that climate change is life thre threatening in Pakistan and in other countries like Pakistan so that is why this is uh, uh, the first priority of uh, the government of Pakistan and uh, other agencies in Pakistan to ensure safety and well-being of the people. Then uh, the second point is uh, sustainable economic growth. And we all know that uh, sustainable economic growth is not possible without make, making our economy uh, climate resilient. So we can say that sustainable climate resilient economic growth and thirdly uh, as we are a responsible nation and now uh, it is uh, being recognized uh, throughout the world uh, and Pakistan is uh, has uh, emerged as a climate leader uh, climate action leader rather uh, in the whole world and we have done few things which I would uh, talk about in the coming slides which uh, makes uh, Pakistan an example for many countries on uh, this planet Earth. 
uh, in terms of commitment and action. So that is why we say that uh, we are committed to fulfill our international commitments uh, like the Paris Agreement or uh, I mean, there are other uh, uh, instruments which uh, actually guide climate action or which require certain actions to be done so that we can uh, minimize the emissions of greenhouse gases. So uh, I belong to the research community. I work in a research center. So firstly, we talk about research and uh, what what we mainly do in uh, in GCISC or uh, in other uh, organizations which are working on the same lines. We basically, uh, I mean, work on uh, closely work on one of the components of uh, this equation. This equation is basically uh, defining the uh, vulnerability of any system, but for because this presentation is focused on water resources. So we'll talk, uh, we say that vulnerability of a water system is defined as a function of the uh, potential impact uh, and the adaptive capacity. So the potential impact uh, is defined as uh, a combination of exposure of the system to that impact and sensitivity of that system to the impact. So uh, most of the research which uh, we are doing uh, in, in the center, we uh, focus on uh, to us assess the exposure of our water system to uh, climate change and its impacts and how sensitive is our system and what is the response of our system. And then of course, uh, how we uh, can uh, make this system climate resilient. And this, uh, the, I mean, this is done through, uh, I mean, coming, uh, through devising different adaptation strategies or uh, to improve the adaptive capacity of the system. So when we talk about uh, climate change impacts uh, and water sources of this country, um, we actually cannot ignore uh, this specific part, which is shown over here as the upper Indus Basin. So this is the uh, uppermost reach of the Indus Basin uh, which you can see, you 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 uh, you can clearly see within the uh, red oval uh, oval shape. There is a lot of white color, and this white color is basically showing the glaciated region in the upper Indus Basin. So it is uh, a recognized fact that uh, uh, I mean, out of the uh, outside of the two poles, North and South Pole. This is the region where we have most concentration of glaciers as compared to any other region, glaciated region in the world. That is why this part is sometimes uh, called as the third pole, because uh, 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 I mean, other than the two northern and southern poles, this is the third pole where we have uh, a lot of glaciers, and these glaciers basically are. Uh, a mainstay for the water resources system, not only in this country, but uh, also the other neighboring countries as well. Some of the facts related to the uh, glaciers of the upper Indus Basin. Uh, I mean, this estimate is from uh, the ISI mode that was done in around uh, 2011. Uh, the recent numbers can be a little bit different, but this gives a good idea. Uh, about the extent of uh, the glacier concentration in the upper Indus Basin. You see the glaciated uh, area is around or more than 15,000 square kilometers. And the ice reserves are more than 2,000 cubic kilometers. Uh, and I mean, there are uh, more than 1,000 glaciers. It, uh, I mean, uh, with the development, with the improved remote sensing uh, data products, 
uh, we can maybe we can uh, this number can change the uh, when we talk about the number of glacier in the upper Indus basin. It can be less, it can be more, but it is around 1,000 uh, glaciers, and uh, I mean this is really huge and the melt water that comes from these glaciers. That is why it makes a significant part of the water flows uh, of the Indus River. Then uh, these glaciers, how are these important for Pakistan or for the Indus River system uh, that is sustaining Pakistan's agriculture? Uh, you see, I mean, if we compare it with other uh, main rivers, principal rivers in different Himalayan countries, and uh, the dependence uh, of those rivers on the uh, meltwater that is coming from glaciers, we see Indus uh, basically uh, in terms of its size, in terms of, I mean, Indus has a mean uh, annual discharge of more than 5,000 cubic meters per second. And this, I mean, high flow river, we see that more than 40% of the water is coming from glaciers. That uh, clearly shows that how important are our glaciers uh, for the flow that is coming into the uh, Indus. Now, uh, it, what is the response of these glaciers? Firstly, we talk about the response of these glaciers globally. The one-liner uh, to say about the response of the glaciers globally is that uh, the glaciers are retreating around the globe. I mean, this is a known fact and we can clearly see in this figure, which is from the World Glacier Monitoring Service, their latest estimate and it shows that uh, whether it is Scandinavia, whether it is Western Canada and USA or Alaska or Southern Andes or Central Europe or Asia or Arctic region. I mean, everywhere the glaciers are rapidly declining. I mean, the gray line, which represents Asia Central, which uh, is representing our region, we can see is uh, among the I mean the uh, among the regions where the glaciers are declining at a rapid rate. But this is the average response of all the glaciers uh, in this region, like uh, the eastern Himalaya, central Himalaya, western Himalaya, Hindu Kush, Karakaram. I mean the average response is that glaciers are fastly retreating and um, their volume is decreasing. But uh, if we talk about the response of glaciers, uh, specifically in the central Karakoram region, which is uh, which we normally call the Pakistan's glaciers, uh, we see that there, uh, there was uh, a, a discovery in 2005 when uh, a very renowned glaciologist, Professor Ken Hewitt uh, said that uh, based on his uh, year research of a number of years, he found that the glaciers in this central Karakoram region of Pakistan, most of the glaciers are either stable or gaining mass. And this discovery uh, is um, uh, called the Karakoram anomaly, the famous Karakoram anomaly. Which, uh, which means that the most of the glaciers in the Karakam region or the central Karakam region are showing a behavior which is anomalous to what is going on around the globe. So uh, there are, I mean, after the after this discovery uh, or after uh, coining of this term in 2005 by Professor Ken Hewitt, uh, a lot of research then. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, focused on this topic and uh, a number of researchers came out with their research work, which shows that uh, what are the main possible factors that are causing Karakaram anomaly. And these are uh, firstly the debris cover thickness on the top of uh, the Karakaram glaciers, then uh, 
the weather regime which is basically responsible for precipitation over these glaciers the uh, i mean monsoon currents do, do not reach this part and most of the precipitation uh, that occurs over here is in winter due to the western disturbances and it is mostly in the form of uh, solid precipitation that is snowfall so that is why it is these glaciers are being fed regularly and uh, that does not at the moment it uh, i mean these most of these glaciers are stable in volume and mm, cannot be considered as uh, losing their mass rapidly and also uh, there for in some studies when the temperature records i mean whatever we have and we mostly have below the elevation of 5000 meters but whatever we have the analysis shows that uh, there is a decreasing trend in the summer temperatures and an increase in precipitation so when there is increase in precipitation and decrease in uh, summer temperature uh, so that obviously supports uh, the stability or increase in volume of the glaciers so these are some of the factors but we say that uh, karakar normally uh, may not be a permanent thing and in the years to come maybe things change in this region as well because we all know that the change is climbing up the mountains and it is uh, mount it is rising at more rapid rates in the mountains than the uh, in the regions with flatter terrains so uh, mountains are uh under more threat the uh, uh, by climate change than other regions so that is why we should not rely on uh, this that the karam uh, karagam region or pakistani glaciers are stable but uh, i mean uh, in future uh, this can be uh, under severe climate change impact uh, so we need to be prepared uh, for that time uh, immediately but at the same time there is also evidence of melting glaciers in pakistan especially on the western himalayan side or the hindu kush region in the hindu kush region uh, there are glaciers that are uh, melting at a very fast rate one example i would uh, like to share with you all is the chitabu glacier in chitral which the royal couple uh, the duke and the duchess were were taken to and they were shown during their uh, i mean uh, a recent visit to pakistan and the reason was the, i mean they asked to uh, uh, to see the melting glaciers in pakistan and they were taken to that part so which shows that this uh, western part the hindu kush and the western himalayan part over their glaciers are melting at very rapid rate uh, very like uh, the eastern parts of uh, himalaya the indian glaciers which are melting at a very rapid rate so uh, this makes uh, i mean this region this karakoram region or the pakistani glaciated region highly uncertain which certainly calls for more research more data and more evidence so that uh, we can come up with uh, some reliable research which we can provide to our policy makers and then the policy makers can uh, devise policies according to that research and those policies then would be very effective to make pakistan a climate resilient country now let me share with you uh, for for the for the students or others who are interested to know that how uh, the rivers response to uh, i mean different river basins where we have snow reserves or glacier reserves how those response to rise in temperature so here i am presenting an example of uh, the transboundary kabul river basin and the gilgit river basin the gilgit river basin uh, you can see the blue polygon on the right is basically a basin which has a high concentration of glaciers while the kabul basin has very low concentration of glaciers but uh, 
more than 80% of the basin is normally snow covered during the winter season. So a lot of uh, water in the Kabul River comes from the snow melt. So we can call the Kabul River as the snow melt river uh, and the Gilgit River as the uh, snow and glacier melt river. So in this slide you see on the right is the response of the Kabul River Basin and on the uh, left is the response from the Gilgit River Basin. So when uh, water is coming from uh, glaciers, mostly from glaciers, with rise in temperature we see that uh, the peak in the flow uh, is not shifting earlier, but it is getting flatter. But we are receiving uh, I mean the river, the rise in the river flow uh, we see is, is being started under future scenarios earlier uh, than before. Uh, I mean, the dotted blue dotted line is basically showing, uh, you can say, the flows th that are prevailing that we are observing uh, right now. And the other lines are showing the future scenarios. Uh, the blue uh, solid continuous blue line is showing uh, the uh, response of the Gilgit River under a future scenario, which is uh, the um, in, uh, near the end of the century. And uh, also, I mean, yellow line is from another model. So, I mean, there, there are uh, the different models are showing uh, different results, but uh, mostly are agreeing on this point that the flat is going to, uh, the uh, peak is going to flatten and also we will receive earlier uh, flows than uh, it, these are coming nowadays. But as far as the uh, changes in river flow, uh, when we talk about the panels on the right side and we talk about the Kabul River Basin, we see that the peak is getting more sharp in future and it has it is uh, expected to be shifted one month earlier i mean because most of the uh, flow is coming from the melt of snow then and slow uh, response of uh, snow uh, to melt under temperature is quicker faster than the glacier melt response so that is why the uh, snow melt is coming quickly to uh, feed the river and that is why we we see that the peak is uh, peak has been shifted earlier and it is it has become more sharp and uh, there is also evidence uh, i mean the, the our analysis shows that uh, the high to very high flood uh, events are going to be more frequent in the uh, coming decades and you see the uh, the I mean immediate the, the this uh, decade which we are going through uh, by the end of uh, this decade and also uh, by around the mid of this century we see that there are more events uh, which are even above the uh, the region of high to very high flood so more events of high to very high floods and there are also events which are even higher than uh, these this magnitude of flood so uh, which shows that uh, the flash flooding and the flooding events in the Kabul basin especially in the flat flatter terrain uh, which lies mostly in Pakistan uh, I mean there would be more uh, flood risk in that region and then uh, it, it calls for immediate actions to come up with some early warning systems so that we can save the uh, lives and properties of the people uh, in the coming years. People are already uh, suffering from flooding events over there, but I mean, more frequent floods will, will make them more vulnerable and it would then uh, make uh, uh, their life, their livelihoods highly unsustainable. As far as the flows that are uh, uh, we are observing at the uh, Bisham Gila, which is a, a, a station just upstream of the Tarbela Reservoir, we see on the on the left in the left panel, left upper panel, we see that in terms of the annual total volume of flow, uh, uh, I mean for the period of 1969 to 2013 or 14, 
I mean, there is no statistically significant trend which shows that we cannot uh, say with certainty that uh, there is an increasing trend in the uh, flow volume that is being received at uh, the Tarbela Reservoir. But in terms of the uh, flooding events that are being recorded at this, uh, this station, uh, you see the uh, number of events that has a magnitude of more than 12,000 cubic meter per second, uh, which falls in the category of high flood, we see that these events are becoming uh, more and more in the recent decades, which shows that although there is no uh, clear evidence of uh, change in the annual uh, total volume uh, of, uh, of the uh, flows that are coming from the upper Indus Basin, but it but the shows that the distribution of that flow has changed and it is now now coming in in the form of extreme events uh, or you can say that uh, i mean uh, uh, there are times in a year when uh, there is very less flow but when uh, then suddenly a very high flow comes and uh, in the form of a flood and causes damage and it can it may also be uh, linked to uh, the uh, increase in the frequency of the uh, glacier, glacier lake outburst floods. Uh, when we have evidence that uh, there is an increase in the uh, events that, which we call the glacier, glacial lake outburst floods. There are more uh, lakes formation in the lower part of the glaciated region and then uh, there are uh, more events that these lakes are uh, getting outburst and causing high floods and damages. So, which clearly shows that uh, uh, Pakistan um, is, uh, as we all know, that have been among the uh, list of the uh, countries, uh, I mean, the among the top 10, which are most affected by climate change. And the effect of climate change on Pakistan is mostly in the form of uh, all times of almost all types of uh, extreme events, mostly in the form of uh, floods and uh, I mean, droughts, and then it is also in the form of wind storms and hail storms and cyclones and I mean, you name it. Uh, on this slide, uh, just to give you an idea that uh, if in future, I mean, uh, under uh, an extreme climate scenario, uh, our glaciated region uh, decreases uh, to, uh, I mean, um, say to 50%. Uh, and temperature, we assume that temperature rise by then would be around 3 degrees centigrade. Then what is going to happen to the flows that are coming to the, uh, from the upper Indus Basin? And you see that uh, it has a drastic shift in the flow regime of the upper Indus Basin. It may cause a drastic shift in the flow regime of the upper Indus Basin. And uh, you see that the peak would be shifted earlier. And also we would start receiving flows uh, even from the uh, month of March which was a low flow year previously, but in future it can become uh, a month with uh, which will have significant flows. So this obviously would uh, have would, would will have severe implications for the current uh, water distribution strategy. So we would uh, then have to uh, make certain changes to our water distribution strategy so that we can provide water uh, to the different uh, water uses at the right time and in the right amount. So, I mean, this is highly alarming for a highly uh, vulnerable country and a country which is already highly affected by climate change. This is really alarming that in the future times, uh, climate change can uh, bring about uh, drastic changes in the uh, river flows which would make uh, life very tough if we are not well prepared. So we need to get ourselves ourselves prepared well in time, uh, well before time. Uh, we need to come up with strategies 
uh, and I mean that is why I call that this uh, challenge is also basically an opportunity for a country like Pakistan that if we uh, start to uh, take certain measures to save water uh, in our distribution system like I uh, mentioned earlier by uh, through lining of uh, canals are the required segments and also by adopting water efficient uh, techniques and technologies at the farm level uh, when if we do that I mean that would be a blessing in disguise I mean not only we would be uh, I mean, dealing with the uh, water stress future water stress conditions and also high variability of uh, the water coming in our rivers but it would also uh, push our uh, whole agricultural system into uh, the new era and we would be more productive and we would be uh, more on the line of uh, like uh, more crop per drop. So this is, this is actually required uh, even if we don't consider climate change it, it is uh, certainly immediately required in this country but uh, in the name of climate change if we do that that would certainly help a lot of uh, people and a lot of uh, I mean, uh, sectors that are directly or indirectly linked to agriculture and water resources. So for the for the sake of uh, the research community, the students, uh, I have uh, I come up with this these few ideas which are just uh, uh, from my mind, but I mean there are certainly other things that need uh, that need research or uh, that needs to be pondered but I feel that uh, we need more research that should focus on the region which is above the 5000 meter elevation I mean if there is there are no uh, ground stations we need to uh, make use of the other sources of information uh, or rather all possible sources of information that provide us uh, the information uh, that gives us a more clear idea of what is going on or what is the response of the region which is the mostly the glaciated region in Pakistan and it is above the 5000 meter elevation. Then also a relationship of temperature and precipitation change with elevation in UIB. I mean there in other many uh, parts of around the globe uh, there is evidence that uh, the temperature and precipitation uh, change under uh, due to climate change has a linkage uh, with elevation and uh, I mean uh, as we go up the elevation there is uh, more uh, rapid change in temperature and precipitation but we need to investi investigate this in Pakistan specifically because this is going to be very crucial uh, for, for this country. And uh, on the other hand, the spatial that is uh, east to west or north to south pattern of changes in climate and climate extremes uh, in this country and the impact of uh, uh, above and changing water demands on our uh, distribution and management system in this country. These are some of the uh, topics that can be researched by students, but there are others as well. Now uh, let's talk about uh, government of Pakistan's uh, I mean strategies and actions which uh, we can say uh, that uh, this is uh, we turning the challenge into opportunity and uh, doing certain things which were actually required even uh, if we don't do not consider climate change. So some of the adaptation actions uh, uh, which are basically from the climate change policy of Pakistan that was uh, developed and introduced in 2012 and it says that uh, we actually I mean in terms of uh, um, uh, making our water resources sustainable or climate resilient we need to uh, uh, introduce and adopt innovative techniques we need to uh, improve our water management system. We need to increase our water storage uh, through uh, new dams or I mean water storage also includes the groundwater storage and we need to uh, regulate our groundwater uh, usage and also the quality of groundwater. 
that would really going to help us in future and because uh, groundwater storage is a huge storage and we should consider is uh, this as the largest dam in this uh, in this country then monitoring of uh, the cryosphere region the high elevation mountainous region in the north of this country and also the climate change the true response of climate change in that high elevation region uh, to share with you all that uh, pakistan has already adopted the sustainable developmental goals as a national developmental agenda so i mean uh, you see that uh, one of these sdgs uh, number 13 is climate action so i mean uh, even if we follow uh, this commitment uh, um, i mean we we can even then uh, take the uh, climate impacts uh, head on and we can save and make our water sources sustainable then uh, some of the recent, recent uh, initiatives by our ministry ministry of climate change and uh, of course uh, with the help of the research uh, organizations like gcisc and others uh, i mean there have been tree plantation campaigns in uh, the khyber pakhtunkhwa province then also in uh, country wide uh, around 2018 uh, we got uh, our uh, uh, climate change act passed in our parliament which uh, actually uh, is uh, uh, i mean devises certain measures to enhance our climate action or which uh, helps to guide the climate action in this country and actually uh, more uh, make pakistan more climate resilient uh, in terms of uh, actions on ground uh then there is a program in pakistan which we call as the recharge pakistan which is basically uh, about the beneficial use of flood waters i i i have already discussed that climate change is mainly manifesting itself in the form of increased frequency of floods in different parts of the country and in in the in the form of different types of floods so uh, under recharge pakistan we are going to use that uh, flood water whether whether it is uh, the hill torrent flood the flash floods or the flood in the main uh, indus channel uh, we are going to use that water to recharge our ground water or uh, um, i mean restore our existing wetlands and create more wetlands and then it would uh, i mean uh, going to uh, the the uh, calamity is going to become an opportunity or a, a, a benefit uh, providing thing for pakistan then there is a, a, a campaign on clean and green pakistan which actually uh, would improve the uh, quality of environment uh, in in the in the cities mainly and then it would certainly help in uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions Uh, which would be pakistan's contribution in terms of uh, uh, mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions although pakistan's contribution at global level in terms of uh, emissions uh, of the greenhouse gases is very low even uh, less than 1% but still we uh, being a responsible nation we are actually contributing in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions uh in the end i would conclude my presentation by saying that uh climate change we have already seen uh, especially in the uh, when we talk about water resources of this country it has serious implications for pakistan but the a good thing is that pakistan uh, has already started realizing it and we are taking necessary steps so we are converting this uh, huge challenge into opportunity to uh, create more collaborations i mean improve our uh, relationships with uh, other other countries uh, exchange technology and expertise and uh, i mean uh, globally uh, uh, i mean help in, in increasing the climate actions but uh, i mean uh, there are a number of challenges for the scientists and researchers who are working in this region 
So we actually need uh, to make this effort more strong and to find, collate and evaluate the observational data that already exists. And this uh, certainly requires international agreements, uh, collaboration and funding. So our uh, countries, one countries, or we can say Pakistan's climate action can not be sustained by, uh, I mean, by its own, by individually. Uh, it requires uh, regional and international cooperation. And uh, I mean, uh, that would actually uh, make this country climate resilient and also the whole region uh, climate resilient. With this, I, I thank you all for your attention and I would welcome any comments, suggestions or questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, such a nice talk. Uh, now floor is open for question answer. Um, if someone question, please. We get, we are unmuting uh, uh, the probably, attendees we already, mic. Yes. We already Did, short of time. Yes, Maybe we can have open our two quick questions. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> um, OK, we have one question um, in our chat box that the trend is increasing, but by Salahuddin. And he asked that trend is increasing, but statistically not significant. What does it mean? So I think you. you <clears throat> it means you that, that, uh, yeah. yeah okay. Should I answer this yes, question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> OK, so I mean, uh, when we, I mean, uh, scientifically analyze some uh, data set, uh, we, we actually need uh, to have when we we are talking about we are analyzing trends we need that uh, i mean under some statistical uh, tools or under some statistical principles this trend uh, should be significant then we can um, name this trend whether increasing or decreasing but if it is not statistically significant then we uh, I mean, even if we see a slight uh, uh, rising line uh, when we talk about the trend line, even then we we cannot declare it as an increasing or decreasing trend because it 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 would uh, it would mean that uh, we need more data, more evidence to add to it so that it the trend becomes more clear, and then we declare that this is increasing or decreasing trend. So it means, I mean, uh, there is some uh, positive change or there is some slight increase in flows, but that is at the moment not that significant uh, or uh, not that uh, much that we uh, take it uh, very seriously or declare it that <clears throat> the flows are increasing. So we need to be very uh, careful. That is, we, that is why we use uh, statistical principles or statistical measures to gauge whether the trend is negative or positive and whether it is significant or non-significant. Thank okay, you. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, now uh, I will request as we have a short, uh, we are short of time, so I will request all of the participants to turn on their camera for group photo. Turn on your cameras, please. Yeah. 